Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 222 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Have you ever wondered how the capital of the United States came to be situated at Washington, D.C.? I mean, if you really think about it, the banks of the Potomac River is kind of an odd location for a capital. A capital or capital city of a nation is meant to serve as the seat of government. It's a place where you'd expect to find all sorts of grand administrative buildings and workers, and where you'd expect to find an economic, cultural, and intellectual hub. So when you think about the early history of the United States, you realize that some of the nation's first capital cities made a whole lot more sense. I mean, New York and Philadelphia, now these were cities naturally suited and well-situated to serve as capital cities. But in 1790, the United States Congress passed an act for establishing the temporary and permanent seat of the government of the United States, which stated that the government of the United States would establish a new permanent capital along the banks of the Potomac River. So the capital moves from New York to Philadelphia to the Potomac River, which raises the question, What exactly was Congress thinking? Adam Costanzo, a professional assistant professor of history at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi, and the author of George Washington's Washington, Visions for the National Capital in the Early American Republic, has spent some time considering this question, and he has some answers for us. So during this conversation, Adam will take us through the National Capital's journey to Washington, D.C. And as he takes us on this journey, he'll reveal... Why the national capital of the United States occupied nine different cities and towns between 1774 and 1800, and why Congress felt it needed a new permanent seat of government. How Congress came to settle upon building the United States seat of government along the banks of the Potomac River, and the ideas, money, and labor needed to build the District of Columbia. But first, did you know that the best way for podcasts to find new listeners is still by word of mouth recommendations? The advice of friends and family really sticks with us. So please be a good friend and family member and tell the people in your life about your favorite podcasts. And if you really enjoy this podcast, I would really appreciate it if you would help spread the word about it. So please tell your friends, family, and anyone else you meet about Ben Franklin's world. Okay, ready to find out how Washington, D.C. became Washington, D.C. and the capital of the United States? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is a professional assistant professor of history at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. He's interested in urban history and specializes in the history of the early American Republic. We attended graduate school together. He was in the cohort or class just behind mine. And now he's here to share details from his new book, George Washington's Washington. Visions for the National Capital in the Early American Republic. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Adam Costanzo. Hi, Liz. It's great to be here. I'm a big fan of the pod. Well, thanks, Adam. It's really great to have you here. And congratulations. It's been really fantastic to see how you reworked your dissertation into a book. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. All right. So why don't we get to it? At the start of your book, George Washington's Washington, You remind us that Washington, D.C. was not, in fact, the first capital of the United States, that between September 1774 and November 1800, there were, in fact, nine different cities and towns that served as the national capital. And Elizabeth would like to know more about these different capitals and specifically why the national capital kept shifting from one city to the next. Yeah, that's a really fun question from Elizabeth. We had... Across that time, the capital at Philadelphia several times, Baltimore, Lancaster for a single day, York, Princeton, Annapolis, Trenton, and of course, New York and D.C. And the main reason that they moved around was the war. The British occupied and threatened Philadelphia multiple times. 
And the Continental Congress had to leave and flee Philadelphia for that reason primarily. Though they also leave for a couple other reasons in addition to fear of the British. At one point, they're afraid of their own soldiers, though not really afraid that they'll get hurt by their own soldiers. But in June of 1783, a group of disgruntled soldiers demanding their pay comes to the Pennsylvania Assembly Hall, which is also where the Congress meets. And they are there to demand money from the Pennsylvania Assembly. They know better than to try to get money out of the Congress because the Congress doesn't have any money and they know that. Though these are continental soldiers on the Pennsylvania line, they're looking for Pennsylvania to pay them. And when they do that, they show up when the Congress isn't in session so that maybe they can get paid by the Pennsylvania legislature. The congressmen that are there in Philadelphia don't appreciate this. They don't want to look undermined by the state legislature in terms of having a state pay a debt that's owed by the federal government. And so they encourage the state legislators not to deal with these men or to at least put it off for a little while. And the soldiers are convinced to kind of go home and have their hearing at another time. And the legislature tells them that they'll think about it and that that's good enough for them. But after that, pretty much immediately, the Congress decides that maybe sharing this building in Philadelphia and even being in Philadelphia isn't ideal for the national government at that point. And so they're going to leave. At that point, they'll head off to Princeton so that they can avoid this. And some of them, the ones that like a strong federal government are happy to avoid the conflict with the state. And some that like a weak federal government are happy to get out of Philadelphia, which is a large, powerful, elite city. And so those kind of ideals converge there on the decision to get the heck out of Philadelphia at that time. But most of the other times that they'll move from city to city, it's because of either the British or because they've decided that they can have better accommodation somewhere else, something like that. From the way you describe it, it really sounds like Congress had to balance a lot of different levels of politics between the national government and the different state governments and quite possibly even local governments. Yeah, they're really in an odd place because they haven't set down any ideals and any sort of firm patterns for what is the separation between national government and state government and local government often. And so trying to figure all that stuff out on the fly while also in a war is really difficult. So there's a lot going on and a lot in play that they're trying to deal with. You know, when we look at the Constitution, which was drafted in 1787, we often remark on how it separates the powers, that there are these three independent branches of government and that for the purposes of checks and balances, there's just a little bit of overlap between them, you know, but not so much overlap that these branches are not independent. And I bring this up because it really sounds like the early national government in the 1770s really needed a separation of powers between itself and these state and local governments. Yeah, they're really trying to find their own place, right? And we can look at the whole period during the war and the post-war period, the working out through the Articles of Confederation and then into the Constitution as a long effort at trying to figure out, all right, what is the proper separation between state and national power? They realize there must be some national power. They can't organize the war as 13 states, things like that. But they also don't like national power. That's part of the whole point of the war. And so trying to strike that balance is what the Americans were up to for quite a long time. Was it the effort to try and strike that balance? Why we see Article 1, Section 8 in the Constitution? Would you even tell us about this part of the Constitution? Sure. That article and section give Congress a whole bunch of powers. One of the clauses that is in the Article 1, Section 8 that applies directly to the District of Columbia or the capital city says that Congress shall get to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over a district not exceeding 10 miles square, as may by session of the states and acceptance of the Congress become the seat of government. And that gives them a really interesting and odd power because it gives them a special place of their own, which is separate from any state. And that's a new thing for people and a thing that some people don't really like. But 
especially the advocates of a stronger federal government, really think that it's necessary for the federal government to be separated from the rest of the states and state power and things like that. Do you think this is why many anti-federalists, you know, those who oppose the ratification of the Constitution, seem to have such a sense of pause over Article 1, Section 8, that the federal government would be separate and apart from the states and a capital all its own? Yeah, they're really surprised by it in some ways. And they feel like, some of them anyway, it is one of the most dangerous and scary parts of this new constitution that gives so much power to the central government, which is the main thing the anti-federalists dislike. And this is a nice example of that, a sort of small thing hidden in the document that if you look at it through the right lens, looks really insidious, right? One of them called it the most obnoxious part of the proposed plan. This idea of exclusive legislation, right? Exclusive control over a district that the Congress can have. Well, what can they do in that? Can they make their own laws for that area? Does that mean they can just do whatever they want? It really sounds like a nice recipe for corruption. And even more worrisome for them was that the district is enormous. The Constitution says it's not to exceed 10 miles square, which means 10 miles on each side, so 100 square miles. That's really big, especially when you consider the settled area of cities at this time, right? Most of them are under two square miles. So the notion that the federal government might carve out a place for itself that's 100 square miles in which Congress can make the laws for itself and do whatever it wants. If you're an anti-federalist and you're really wary of government power, that's a really worrisome clause in the Constitution. This is a really fascinating discussion because when we study the process of the Constitution's ratification today... The power of the national government over the national capital is really not a concern that we hear a lot about, you know, as something that was raised by the anti-federalists or those who were on the fence about the Constitution and its powers. No, definitely. And the anti-federalists did a lot of that. You look through the debates in each of the states, you see them bringing up things, you know, just the way we sort of would in politics today, if a bill is released or a plan is put out, the other party looks at it with the kind of worst possible intentions or the worst possible view and said, well, look, look what you're doing here. That's crazy, right? Like the death panel debate during the Obamacare debates, right? There's nothing in there about death panels. But if you really want to read it in this one weird way, maybe you could scare some people, right? So we get a very similar thing going on here where the anti-federalists are looking at this from this point of view that says that strong government power is corrupting and evil. And Suddenly, you look through the document and it says they can do all these things. They can make war. They can control this and that. And also, they're going to create this place where they can do whatever they want. That's really frightening. And speaking of this place that would be separate, Tom is curious about how and why Congress decided to establish a permanent capital on the banks of the Potomac River. And this does seem a bit curious because all of the other cities you mentioned were located specifically in mid Atlantic states. And Washington, D.C.? Well, that's a southern city. So how did Congress select the location of what we now know as the District of Columbia? Well, this is a really difficult process for them. The Potomac location is chosen once Congress agrees that the capital will be in the South. There's a very famous story about Thomas Jefferson brokering a deal over dinner between James Madison and Alexander Hamilton in which the location of the capital is basically traded to the Southerners for approval of Hamilton's plan for federal assumption of state debts. And most of those state debts are held by northern states. So it seems like there's this kind of exchange here. You sign our bill for assumption of the debts, and we'll sign your bill for giving you the capital in the South. Of course, we only have Jefferson's word on that, that that's how things were worked out. And there are definitely some historians that are a little wary of that story. But the first Congress does pass both of those bills. And once we establish that there'll be a capital in the South, then the Potomac is really the rather obvious place because it is in the northernmost part of the South. So the capital will still basically be in the center of the nation. Potomac promoters are also really interested in connecting the river to the West. And so they hope 
that in the future, the Potomac might also be a gateway to the West, which would also be great for a national capital. But there were other locations in the South that Congress could have considered. And I wonder, did Congress consider other locations besides the banks of the Potomac? I mean, did towns in, say, Kentucky lobby Congress with incentives and benefits to bring the nation's capital to their area, you know, like people do today for Amazon headquarters and such? Did any of this take place while Congress was trying to make its decision? Yeah, definitely. During the debates before the Southern Capitol is agreed upon on the Potomac, we have all sorts of cities pitching in and the state representatives are trying to assert that their state would be the best. The obvious places like New York and Philadelphia, but also other places in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, like you said, in that kind of mid-Atlantic region that can really make a claim to being the sort of geographic center of the country, depending on how they want to think about it. There's a lot of hats in the ring there. There's a very good book called The Creation of Washington, D.C. by a guy named Kenneth Bowling, who details in tremendous detail the battles over where the capital should be and how it should be placed and things like that that I really recommend for a detailed look at this particular debate in American history. So what was the pitch that landed the capital on the banks of the Potomac? Well, their easiest pitch, once the Potomac is chosen for the site of the capital, the particular spot on the Potomac is at the southernmost point of where the Residence Act, this bill that they passed saying it can be on the Potomac. What's now Washington, D.C. is the southernmost part of that. In fact, it's even a little farther south than what the act says, because Washington wants and asks Congress to amend the law because he wants to include Alexandria in Virginia, which is roughly Washington's hometown, right? Mount Vernon's only about six miles as the crow flies from Alexandria. So as soon as it's announced that the Potomac will be the place for the capital, Washington has a choice. They leave it to Washington, but everyone's pretty sure he's going to select the southernmost choice, which is where the city is now. He does make a tour of the rest of the river. He goes upriver to places like Sharpsburg, Maryland, and he looks around up there. It sort of surprises the people up there and doesn't really tell them they're coming so they can't prepare a pitch for him. But no one really expects him to put it up there anyway. There's not a hell of a lot of people up there. And it's not his hometown, which Alexandria is, and it's not close to his home. And so everyone basically expects him to be putting it down at the southernmost part of the area available from the Residence Act, which is where the city stands today. How did George Washington become involved with this project? Wasn't he the chief promoter of the Southern Potomac position? Well, Washington gets to make the call. This is one of the things that the Congress allows Washington to do. They put it in his hands and he makes the call that it will be at this particular point. The region has promoters that are encouraging a capital city at this location. And some of them have been doing that for a while, saying that the Potomac would be a kind of idyllic location for a national capital. It's roughly central. And if we could only just figure out how to connect the river to the west beyond the Appalachians, then it'll be a kind of gateway to the west. And that's something they'll really like. So there are voices pushing in that direction. And Washington has long been a promoter of the Potomac region. He's been involved with the organizations that are trying to work out ways to promote the Potomac and get that connection made to dredge parts of it so that it's easier to travel on or to build canals or paths around the various falls of the Potomac so that maybe you can't sail all the way up. But with piecing together some of these bits of infrastructure, you might be able to connect the Potomac to the west on the other side of the Appalachians. Washington's long been a promoter of those sorts of things. And so it's no great shock when he chooses this region, and it's no great shock that he's a big advocate for it. Now, as Congress considered the Potomac, what were they considering in terms of its topography and geography? What did the area where they wanted to place the new capital look like? Well, mostly it's a combination of Chesapeake farmland and woods. There's not a heck of a lot there. Georgetown pre-exists, but at this time, Georgetown is a couple streets, a couple blocks, really, of town. Not all that many people and not very much to see there. And the rest of what we now regard as the District of Columbia 
is Chesapeake farmland or woodlands. And so that's really what they're buying and what they're buying into when they decide to put the capital there. There's no real large scale development there yet at all. So Congress allowed George Washington to choose the exact location of the new national capital. And he selected the southernmost part of the Potomac River, which seems to have just been the home of farm fields, woodlands, and the small settlement of Georgetown. Adam, what was George Washington thinking? Did he have a vision for the new national capital and what it could become when he advocated for its move to the southern banks of the Potomac? Well, his vision is for a kind of grand central unifying place for the country. And we see that as we fold in the details of the plan that will get worked out between Washington and Peter Charles Lafont, who he hires to design the city, their plan and their city is a very grand city. It's enormous. They don't use the full 10 mile square because they locate it in two cities and there's a good bit of Potomac River in that square. But still the full plan for the capital city as laid out by L'Enfant is something like nine square miles when other cities are really much smaller than that at this time. The idea of connecting it to the West, Washington believes in. L'Enfant talks, in fact, also about connecting North and South being in this place where it's roughly in the center between the two. So L'Enfant believes that Northerners and Southerners can come together in a place like this and have some of their suspicions of one another melt away because they work together in this place. So they've got this vision that they'll put forward that offers a really grand national capital, one to unify the nation in lots of ways. And that grandeur is something that they'll lay out in the Lafayette plan and they'll put forward as this vision for the capital. Pierre L'Enfant's name always seems to come up when we talk about Washington, D.C. and its layout. So would you tell us more about L'Enfant and how he became involved with building the nation's capital? So L'Enfant was a Frenchman. He was the son of a painter at court in France. And at age 22, he is going to leave his education, his college career, studying art, and he's going to come join up the American cause. And he's going to be one of the Frenchmen that come over, people like Lafayette, right? He's going to be one of these Frenchmen that comes over to the new United States when the revolution is declared and independence is declared. And he's going to fight on the side of the Americans. During his six years with the army, he's going to be one of the people that winters at Valley Forge with Washington and his troops. He'll be wounded during a siege in Savannah. He'll be captured by the British at one point in Charleston. And after he's released, he rejoins the Continental Army, eventually rising to the rank of major. And so this is how Washington gets to know him. After the war, he'll be a member of the Society of Cincinnati, like Washington, the organization of soldiers and sailors and naval officers dedicated to perpetuating the goals of the revolution. And after the war, in peacetime, he begins working as an architect. And he first achieves fame with his redesign of the City Hall in New York City to become the Federal Hall, the first meeting place of the U.S. Congress under the new Constitution. And even by that time, he's already proposed to Washington that he'd like to be a designer for a national capital. He's kind of got ideas about what a national capital would be, and he's already kind of lobbying for that job even before the Residence Act and that it's decided that we'll do this sort of thing. Okay. So like the decision to place the capital on the southern banks of the Potomac River, Congress gives George Washington the power to oversee the construction of the new capital, and Washington hires Pierre L'Enfant to design and build said capital. As I think about these facts, Adam, it occurs to me that voting on a new capital and planning to build it are one thing, but funding it and building it are quite another. So How did the United States government go about acquiring the land that it needed to build this nine square mile capital and financing the construction of its actual buildings? Well, they do it in ways we would not expect. Lafont had proposed that the nation borrow a million dollars against its real estate holdings in the city, but they don't go with that plan. Lafont, not too long into his career after he designs the city, is let go by Washington. He 
is too much of a kind of strong-willed artist with a vision that his way is the only way. And after the plan is produced, really what they need is not a strong-willed artist, but some bureaucrats and some people who can work with the Maryland legislature to accomplish what they need, right? L'Enfant is not the person for those tasks. And so after butting heads with the people that were hired for those tasks, he's eventually let go. And they don't go with his idea for funding things. There's a plan initially that maybe a Bostonian comes down and he says, well, we could build it as a joint stock company, but no one buys any shares in his stock company. So that doesn't work. And the way it eventually works is that Maryland and Virginia will pay in. Maryland and Virginia pay in $72,000 and $120,000 respectively, because they're the states giving the land and it's valuable for them to be proximate to the national capital. So they want to pay to make it work. And the rest of the funding for the city is going to come from the sale of land in the city. So they make a very complicated arrangement with the original landowners in the city. And what they do is they pay them outright only for areas in the city that will become federal property. So the parts of the city that will become the National Mall or the land the White House is on or the Capitol building, right? Actual bits of federal property. They're paid about $66 per acre for that type of land. Landowners in the Capitol will freely turn over land set aside for streets and avenues. So they just give up that land because it's going to become streets. And then all the rest of the land that will become all the sort of grid of squares that you see on a map of Washington, those are divided between the federal government and the original landowner. So if I'm an owner of land and a plan has been produced and this plot of land is going to be a city square, then that square is divided. They plot it out into different lots, usually maybe depending on the size of the square, a dozen lots or six to eight lots, something like that. And the government and the landowner split those lots. So in a square, the government ends up owning half the lots and the landowner ends up owning half the lots in a square. The landowner doesn't get any money for the land turned over to the government in that square. What the landowner gets is those lots. And so rather than paying him, what they're saying is, you'll be able to make money later by selling these lots. So that's how you're going to make money in this scenario, right? The land that they had paid them for that would become federal property, really, they only outlay something like $36,000 to pay for that land. And that even is money that they'll get from later sale of city lots. And so no money comes from Congress for this. The federal treasury doesn't spend a dime in Washington on buying the land. In the long run, they will, but initially anyway. These funding plans are really interesting because you mentioned land, a joint stock venture company, loans, donations from Maryland and Virginia. But what surprises me is that you never once mentioned taxes. And this seems really interesting because today when the government wants to do something, it usually raises taxes to generate the revenue that it needs. So, Adam, why didn't Congress include taxes as a possible funding model? Well, the early federal government does not really have much money, it turns out. They've got very little revenue. They're making some money from things like the whiskey tax and things like that. And they're at the beginnings of land sales in the Northwest Territory. But they don't have a heck of a lot of money coming in. And a lot of it is, in fact, going to pay interest on the national debt. And so they can't really afford to build a city. And this is part of the problem that Washington and the Federalists, who largely agree with his grand vision for a capital have is that the nation doesn't really have the means to create a capital like this. It's a lovely vision, but they literally can't do it. They don't have the money for it. They don't really even have the economic skills to pull it off in the way that they're trying by kind of using land speculation to get themselves a start and get themselves the money they'll need to then build the White House and the Capitol. They're not really even sophisticated enough and good enough at that to make that work. That also fails. And so they're trying to do this very much on the cheap. And this also kind of makes sense with the time period, because not only is the federal government very, very small at this time, but they're still a brand new government. They 
can only tax the people so much. They've already had problems with the taxing that they've done and whether or not people believe that this new government is as oppressive as the British and things like that. So their options are really limited. And they go with this option of trying to exploit the speculation market. And that really doesn't work out for them. Once Congress figured out how it was going to use the speculation market to fund the building of the new capital, how did they actually go about building it? Who were the people that they hired to actually carry out this work? As I kind of alluded to, LaFont isn't going to be the person who's going to be the everyday bureaucrat in charge of building this city, making sure that workers are at work on time and things like that. That's not his temperament. And Washington is going to hire a set of commissioners, men that he believes will be able to manage this project. Their qualifications are largely that they're from the region. Most of them come from the ranks of promoters of the Potomac, people who had been previously involved with things like the Potomac Company, trying to make sure that this region grew. And they own land in the region, though none of them own land in the city. They avoid that particular level of conflict of interest where one of the commissioners literally owns land in the city. They'll they'll be able to purchase their own land, but none of them are taken from the original landowners in the town. And these guys are kind of middling bureaucrats and politicians in the early Republic era. They're not stars and they're not names. If you're not from the region, then you probably recognize they're folks that might have attended Congress from Virginia or from Maryland, from one of these regions, right? That level of politician and bureaucrat. People they can safely send to the Maryland legislature to ask for money or to ask for help in laying down laws in the city because Maryland law still applies in the city. So they've got to deal with that. That actually sounds like a really smart strategy because people trust people they know. And if Congress or Washington had tried to bring in folks from other states and areas, trust, you know, the relationships and knowledge of the land needed to build the capital would have been more complicated to come by. Yeah, right. They are people that know the region. And that helps because the way they'll run a lot of this project is in a very local way. They'll get enslaved labor from local Maryland landowners, and they'll be able to know where things like Sandstone is available. They'll be quarrying stone for the public buildings from Aquia Creek down in Virginia. So their knowledge of the local region allows them to better pull off this project. So it sounds like the commissioners oversaw the construction of Washington, D.C., but who provided the physical labor and know-how to actually build the capital? Lynn is particularly curious about the role freedmen and enslaved people would have played in building the capital. Sure. Their workforce is primarily unskilled labor, though they have a number of skilled laborers. They need stonecutters and masons for building the White House and the Capitol. And this is primarily the work that's going on there. Their job is to build the White House and the Capitol as far as the commissioners are concerned. And when they're selling lots, it's to raise money to build the White House and the Capitol, right? Because the Residence Act says the government's coming in 1800. So they've got a decade to get these buildings up. And at the White House and the Capitol, they need these skilled laborers. They'll import some of those guys from Europe and from other parts of the U.S., stonemasons and people like that. But there's a whole lot of unskilled labor that also needs to go on. People who are literally just moving blocks of stone or making bricks or cutting lumber for these projects. And a lot of that unskilled labor is done by enslaved people who lived in the region. In the city itself, nearly 40% in 1800 of the households own slaves. And blacks, both free and enslaved, make up about 23% of the population in the city in 1800. But even from beyond the city, what they tend to do is that the commissioners will purchase a year of labor of an enslaved person from a local landowner who has slaves to spare, essentially. And they'll purchase that labor and that enslaved person will forced to come live in Washington. It'll now be the commissioner's responsibility to feed and clothe and house them as it was their owner's responsibility before that. And that enslaved person will now work on, in particular, these unskilled tasks. And about half of the labor force around 1800 and the late 1790s 
there's probably about 200 laborers working in the public buildings once, once they've really got them rolling along. And probably about half of that labor force is enslaved. And the other half is a mix of free laborers, some who have migrated to the city in order to find work. That doesn't turn out to be a particularly lucrative plan because while it might seem like a good idea, oh, I hear they're building these big buildings, they must need laborers. The fact that they can purchase the labor of enslaved laborers for so much of the labor means that they don't have to pay very much for the paid laborers that are working alongside them. The existence or the presence of the slave labor force keeps the wages really low for the wage labor force. So they're able to exploit not only the labor of the enslaved, but also to leverage that to exploit also the labor of the free laborers for less than what they might be able to earn elsewhere. Those people, both free and enslaved, tend to live, especially the lesser skilled workers, tend to live pretty similar lives in terms of the housing they've got for them. A lot of them are mustered together. They sleep on site in shacks and sheds and log cabins and things like that. And they have overseers that oversee their labor and the government feeds them. They're given things like salted herring and salted pork and cornmeal. So they're fed, they're fed together. They're both getting that meal, both types of worker. Obviously, as much as things might be similar, in the end, things are very, very different for the enslaved laborers who have no choice of being there and also can't use any pay to augment whatever they might be given, right? The paid laborer is getting that meager meal, but also he's getting pay. And so if he wants more food, he can buy it. So, you know, as much as they might be keeping them together and working them together, the big differences that stand out between enslaved labor and free labor do shine through in the way that people are living their lives. But broadly, these buildings are built with a mix of enslaved labor and free labor. And that's how the White House and the Capitol building get put together. Now, in 1800, President John Adams and his administration moved the nation's capital from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. And after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, Adam, I hope you'll tell us what the government thought about its brand new home. I hope you've been enjoying our conversation about the early history of Washington, D.C. It's kind of amazing to me that Congress tried to fund the construction of the nation's capital by land speculation. I mean, that's just not something we would think about today. Now, as we know from our weekly explorations of the past, history is full of interesting stories of power struggles, financial ups and downs, and individual passions. All of these stories have shaped the world we live in today, and you can discover more about them and how the past has influenced our present through Audible, because Audible has an unbeatable selection of audiobooks. With Audible, you can listen to many of the books our guests have discussed on this podcast, such as our feature from episode 117, Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of Imagination, by historians Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Oniff, or a feature from our Doing History Biography series, episode 211's John Marshall, The Man Who Made the Supreme Court, by best-selling author Richard Brookheiser. Audible members can choose three titles every month, one audiobook and two Audible originals, which are titles you can't hear anywhere else, but that you can listen to on any device, anytime, anywhere. And right now, Ben Franklin's World listeners can take advantage of a 30-day free trial Go to audible.com slash bfworld or text bfworld to 500-500 to take advantage of this free trial. That's right. By visiting audible.com slash bfworld or by texting bfworld to 500-500, you can take advantage of Audible's 30-day free trial. Audible, the most inspiring minds, the most compelling stories. So, Adam, what exactly did the government move into when it relocated the national capital from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. in 1800? What was the lay of the land like and what buildings existed? It's not much. By 1800, there are just about a little over 100 brick homes strewn across the length of the city. And keep in mind, again, the city is huge. So 100 brick homes, you know, if they were tightly packed together, that might mean something but they're not, right? You get some small clusters near the public buildings, some small clusters over near Georgetown, some down at the confluence of the Potomac River and the Eastern Branch, now called the Anacostia River, where the two rivers meet at the sort of peak at the bottom of the city. 
or the peninsula at the bottom of the city. Some people are down there because that'll be a good shipping area. But the people are spread all throughout. And there's in the city itself what becomes Washington City, the area defined by the Lafon plan. In 1800, there's only like 3,200 people there. And the Lafon plan stretches across nine square miles. So that's pretty, pretty spaced out, right? In New York City at that time, there are 60,000 people and they have squished themselves into one and a half square miles. So it's not exactly a densely populated urban center that they're coming to. Abigail Adams wrote on her way in that woods are all you see from Baltimore until you reach the city, which is only so in name. It says here and there, there is a small cot with a glass window interspersed among the forest through which you travel miles without seeing any human being. Later, she said, in the city, there are buildings enough if they were compact and finished to accommodate Congress and those attached to it. But as they are and scattered as they are, I see no great comfort for them. So when they arrive, there's not much there. The White House and the Capitol building are both half finished, though capable of supporting and housing the president and Congress. And the rest of the city is a kind of mishmash of here and there, there are buildings. And there's no real sense as to how it is that this grand plan might become an actual thing, right? Because so little of it is laid out at this point. Of course, I guess we should keep in mind that the Adams administration only resided in the new capital for what, about five months before Thomas Jefferson and his administration moved in. Right, right. The Adamses come in in 1800 and then promptly lose the election and leave the next spring. So I guess we also really need to ask what President Thomas Jefferson made of the new capital when he moved in in March 1801. Well, one of the things that, especially when I talk to folks that are fans of D.C. history, one of the things that often surprises people is the way I deal with Jefferson. Because he loves architecture and he's got this great love of architecture. And early on, as Washington's Secretary of State, he'll be put in charge of organizing some of this. He's the one who has to deal with L'Enfant, most of all, and he's sent to talk to the locals occasionally to make sure that they're in line. And then once he becomes president, he rather micromanages Benjamin Henry Latrobe's work at the White House and the Capitol building because he loves architecture. So he's constantly looking over the shoulder of the architect who's working on those buildings. But when we look at the government's role in city development, in, okay, do we want Washington to grow? Do we want its streets to become streets? Do we want this plan that L'Enfant has laid down to become a reality? We see that Jefferson and then his successors in the Jeffersonian Republican Party are really no great friends of the city. His ideological vision for the nation has a deep impact on his leadership for the capital. Jefferson's no great fan of cities. He equates them with the corruption and vice that happen in Europe and that define the European monarchies. He once famously wrote to Madison that our governments will remain virtuous for many centuries as long as they are chiefly agricultural, and this will be as long as there shall be vacant lands in any part of America. When they get piled upon one another in large cities, as in Europe, they will become as corrupt as in Europe. And Jefferson's no great fan of these cities. He doesn't want large urban centers. He's got no interest in the strong, powerful federal government that the Federalists wanted and that Washington presents such a great symbol of, right? You build a giant, impressive capital to suggest that your government is strong and impressive. And Jefferson's not particularly interested in that message. So he'd rather have a weak central government that rules over a largely agricultural republic. So he is not rushing at all to fill the city with new buildings and new people. Now, he will fancy himself an architect and he will bother the workers at the Capitol building a great deal. But across his time, what we see is that Jefferson and then Madison and Monroe are really rather unwilling to fund anything in the city other than the two public buildings or the executive buildings that are also in the city and then Pennsylvania Avenue between them. Jefferson's willing to spend money on Pennsylvania Avenue because it connects the White House and the Capitol. Anything beyond there? No. The Republican vision, the Jeffersonian vision is basically, why would we spend federal tax dollars on an individual city? Right? They're basically taking the line that they would give if Boston or Murfreesboro, Tennessee said, hey, we'd like to build a street. Can we have federal funds? 
and they'd say, why would we tax all the people for your street? You should tax your own people for that street. Now, we began this discussion talking about how this city belongs to Congress, right? They can't afford, really, to tax their own people. They've got nearly no people there. They've got a very small tax base. And their largest landowner, the federal government, doesn't pay any property taxes. So they can't tax them. Right? So when the city does ask for help, largely the Jeffersonians are going to ignore them. You know, this is a really interesting history because within a decade, you have George Washington with a grand vision for the nation's capital, a vision that sees the capital as uniting the American people. And then you have Thomas Jefferson and his vision for the nation's capital, which is a capital that is decidedly less urban. So I'd really love to know what happens with this vision for the city when the War of 1812 comes to town. Because as we know, in 1814, the British Army marched into Washington, D.C. and burned it. So Adam, would you tell us about the British burning of Washington and what happened in the aftermath of this act? So in 1814, as part of the War of 1812, the British are going to get rather tired of just having the Americans pop over the Canadian border. And they are going to send Marines into the heart of America and start taking the war to them. In August of 1814, some of those Marines will travel up the Chesapeake Bay and then into the Potomac River, and they'll disembark and easily defeat a very hastily assembled crew of American soldiers and militiamen at Bladensburg in Maryland. And then those British Marines will march basically right into the national capital. The Americans at this point in the war had already popped over the Canadian border and set fire to York, which is now Toronto, which was the capital for British Canada at the time. So paying them back for the burning of York, the British are going to set fire to the public buildings in Washington. So they'll set fire to the White House, to the Capitol building, to the executive office buildings, to the Navy Yard. There's a lovely story from the head of the patent office at the time, a guy named William Thornton. Thornton's actually, oddly enough, also the original designer of the Capitol building. And at this point, he's the director of the patent office. And he shows up right when the British are thinking of burning down the patent office, because it's obviously a government building. And he makes an argument to them that it's full of private papers, private models of inventions, and that because it's a building full of inventions, that to burn it would be a sort of barbarous thing, like the burning of the Library of Alexandria and that they don't want that on their conscience. And the British soldiers, right, they've been marching all day and setting fires. So they just say, okay, and they move along. And he saves the building. And conveniently enough, that will be the building that Congress will be able to meet in because it ends up being the last large building in Washington. But the British will march in. They will burn down these public buildings, all but the patent office. And fortunately for local residents, a very strong summer storm cropped up that night in Washington, D.C., made things a little worse. But the big benefit to it was that it kept these fires from spreading building to building and all throughout the rest of the city. Also, the loose nature and non-dense nature of development in Washington helps on that front as well, right? It's not a tightly packed city. So the public buildings are burned, but private buildings are spared in 1814. With the British fires having destroyed most of the government buildings, the patent office accepted, of course, Congress must have felt like it had a clean slate on which to rethink its strategy for a national capital. Did Congress think this way? And if they did, did any of this rethinking involve a movement to remove or relocate the capital away from Washington, D.C.? Yes, there were. It didn't take very long at all before members of the House who'd been burned out of their chambers to begin debating removal of the government from the District of Columbia. So meeting at that patent office building, Congress begins to debate the future of the Capitol. And a congressman from New York gets up and says that we should discuss. And he proposes moving the seat of government out of Washington, D.C. And over the next three weeks, there'll be debate over that very issue. They'll discuss the defensibility of the city because the city has just shown itself to be poorly defensible, right? They were just invaded. Now, the proponents of the city will say that, well, we didn't defend it very well. We didn't have the soldiers we needed in the place we needed them. But they'll also bring up other complaints they have about the city. They'll bring up the fact that the city isn't anywhere near the moneyed interests in the Northeast, that when the government needs money, it should be able to go down the street 
to talk to the bankers in New York or in Philadelphia or in Boston. And they can't do that in Washington. There are some banks in Washington, but they are much smaller in terms of their capitalization than the banks in the other older northeastern cities. So they bring up that complaint. They also complain about the quality of their accommodations, right? They're in this tiny building now. It's big enough to house them for now, but it can't be the Capitol building. It's too small for that. And when winter comes, they're going to have to start fires in these claustrophobic rooms and it'll be even worse. So they don't want to meet there. They're worried about their accommodations. A lot of them have disliked the Capitol, right? It's not a lovely place they're happy to take their families to at this point. It's kind of an inconvenience to have to live in Washington, D.C. And so these complaints kind of crop back up. Now, the locals and the defenders of the city, mostly folks from nearby states, are really worried here because they assume that if the government leaves Washington, even if they say, we're leaving while we rebuild, they're worried they'll never come back, that they won't be able to convince Congress to come back to Washington once they've settled in someplace more comfortable. And so they really see it rather as an emergency. Some also make the point that if you're going to set the capital on wheels, that that will just never stop. And it will always be a problem if we're saying that the capital is something we can move and then we'll have partisan battles over where the capital will be, right? That's the last thing we need is another thing for the parties to fight over. So the locals and the folks within the Congress that support the Potomac Capitol press very hard against this removal idea. And it comes real close. That bill to leave the Capitol goes through two procedural readings where it passes. People are willing to give it another here and to continue discussion of it. When it gets to the final vote, at least in the House of Representatives, none of this happens in the Senate. But when it gets to the final vote in the House, it is voted down. But it was pretty close, right? The locals were awful worried that this might become a problem for them and the Capitol might leave. So after the House decides that the nation's capital will indeed remain in Washington, D.C., what took place to help give the city the look and feel that we know the city is having today? Washington doesn't really begin growing in the way we know it today until much later. This will save it. It will keep the city in Washington, and it will actually finally end that discussion because that had been held over the Washingtonians' heads. They were never able to press really hard on the problems they had to really demand that the city fund them better or to do something about the fact that they've had their votes taken away, right? Still today, the residents of Washington don't get a member in Congress. And so Congress has rule over them, but they don't have voting rights in Congress. They have a member in Congress, but without voting rights. That happens right away when they take up residence in the city, that They work it out so that, okay, well, you're not going to have federal representation. And they're not really able to press hard against how terrible that is and how much that runs against everything that the nation has stood for and fought for quite literally in the revolution. Because if they make too big of a stink, what happens if Congress leaves, right? They're never able to push too hard because Congress might leave. Even during the initial phases of deciding on the Potomac Capitol, Washington and Madison and Jefferson, when they talk to the local residents, one of their messages is usually, don't cause any trouble here. Don't fight too hard for more money for your land. Because if you do, if you anger Congress to the point where they say, maybe it's not worth it to have the Capitol on the Potomac, it's not coming back. There's not going to be a second chance here, right? And so this has been looming over them for a long time. And in 1814, it finally gets resolved because the government says, no, we're staying here. We're going to rebuild the Capitol building. We're going to rebuild the White House and rebuild the executive office buildings. So that really takes that terrible issue of might the Congress leave from over the head of the Washingtonians, right? Because it would ruin everything about all their lives in Washington. Though they've earned that, not much changes. They'll decide to rebuild, but we're going to fall back into the same sort of Jeffersonian pattern of, yes, they'll rebuild the Capitol building. They find that they have to rebuild the whole thing, basically, even though it's a stone building. And you might think, well, if it burns, you just have to rebuild the wood inside. What they find is that it was built so poorly the first time that they've really rather got to take the whole thing down and start again. And so they'll rebuild the buildings. 
but they're not going to start investing in the rest of the city, right? It doesn't change that central Jeffersonian tenant that the money for the federal government doesn't really belong to and shouldn't be paid to development in Washington, D.C. beyond the public buildings and Pennsylvania Avenue. So that remains the status quo even after the War of 1812 and the efforts to rebuild the capital, which they'll be back in in about four years in the new capital. It'll be ready enough to house Congress. Things are going to start to change in the Jacksonian administration, interestingly enough. Though we often think of the Jacksonians as the kind of ideological heirs to the Jeffersonians, who are also fairly small government folks, by the Jacksonian era, the country is more of the grand empire that Washington and L'Enfant were thinking about when they planned the city. In a much more real way, the country stretches out across the Mississippi. It stretches out into the continent. And people are coming to Congress from really far away, from all these new states out west. And the country feels more like a grand empire. And the idea that it should have a capital that's befitting of such a grand empire makes more sense to the Jacksonians than it ever did to the Jeffersonians. And so we'll see, starting in the Jacksonian era, some moves toward assistance with the city. The city gets itself in terrible financial straits, thanks to the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, to the point where there's a kind of choice between allowing the cities to go bankrupt or the federal government bailing them out. By the cities, I mean Georgetown, Washington City, and Alexandria. So the Jacksonians will complete that bailout. They won't just say, well, that's your own problem. I don't see why the federal government should help you, right? It's obvious why the federal government should help them. It's the capital city. And so they'll agree to that logic and they'll begin helping the city. They'll also begin building projects that are much grander than we've seen. They establish a couple of buildings like the Treasury Building that's right next to the White House, right? They'll do away with the old treasury because of a fire. But those old executive buildings had been pretty simple federal style three-story wooden buildings. The treasury building we have today that they build at that time is enormous and it's all Romanesque columns, right? So, okay, that's a different style. That's something much more akin to the style of the White House and the Capitol building. So they're going to start to build on a much grander scale. The other buildings they'll start at this time will be the building that now houses the Portrait Gallery, which is a very big Greek-style building, and the building next door to it that's now a hotel, but it's also a classical-style building. And that one's made of marble, not even sandstone. So they really start to build big in the Jacksonian era. But to get to your original question from long, long ago, where we really start to see the city start to become much more the city we know, we start to see it fill with people and become a real city is in the Civil War because of its centrality to the war, because of its place at the front lines, essentially, of the war, and because of its place as a refuge of freed people who are escaping the South and things like that. It really balloons during the Civil War and starts to become the full city that the L'Enfant Plan suggests that it might be. Adam, Before we move into the time warp, what do you think the history of Washington, D.C.'s early past can tell us about the city and nation today? Why do you think we should spend time to better understand, as you put it, George Washington's Washington? Well, what I really love about studying Washington is how much it reinforces the fact that the spaces and places we construct have meaning. And that meaning is really obvious when we talk about a deeply symbolic place like the national capital, right? We imbue it with symbolism because it's the national capital. But all of the spaces and places that we create that make up our built environment say something about who we are as a people. And at the same time, they kind of affect our lives, the options we have before us at any given time and the choices that we make. So exploring the development of George Washington's Washington helps us see the way that our physical world both reflects and affects who we are as people. Now let's move into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Adam, in your opinion, what might have happened if Pierre L'Enfant had not quit? 
If he had seen the building of Washington, D.C. through, how would the look and feel of the district have been different? Well, that's an interesting question, right? Because I don't think he would have been very successful at some of the jobs that the commissioners take on that I sort of mentioned, that they needed bureaucrats and they needed politicians, and he wasn't going to be a good one of those. But a lot of the locals were really upset when he was fired. They were upset because they looked at L'Enfant as a visionary, and then they looked at these bureaucrats as bureaucrats, and you'd really rather have the visionary, right? And especially if your land and now your success and your profitability is going to be tied to the success of this place, you would rather have the visionary leading you into a visionary future, right? That's going to make you more money and that's going to be better for you in the long run. So the locals are a little upset about this because they do lose their visionary leader and they get some rather unvisionary bureaucrats. However, L'Enfant wasn't going to make much of a difference as far as their inability to pay for the city. And he wasn't going to be able to drum up more money than the commissioners were. If things had worked a little more smoothly in some places, maybe they might have avoided some of the bumps. But broadly, they're moving forward with that plan to fund the city as a kind of experiment in speculation. And the whole nation has a speculative bubble that bursts in the late 1790s, solidly ruining all of that speculation economy. So they probably wouldn't have survived that either way in terms of really moving forward with a more successful build of the city. However, when they do lose L'Enfant, they do lose some aspects of his plan for the city. Rather unimportantly, they straighten out Massachusetts Avenue. Okay, that's not that big of a deal. But one of the things that I find real interesting about the L'Enfant plan is that he sets aside 15 of the squares in the city, the sort of meeting places, the places where traffic circles are in the city today, or parks and monuments, right? These big intersections of the Grand Avenues. He sets 15 of those aside for the states. And he wants the states to each take responsibility for one of them. And he wants them to erect their statues dedicated to revolutionary war heroes or to other Republican ideals. And he wants them to move people down there to take up residence in the city. And he has this kind of vision of all the states pitching in towards the city, filling it up with people and filling it up with civic pride so that it becomes this unifying force for the nation, right? And when he leaves, they take his map and his plan for that, and they make some tweaks to it, but largely it stays in place. But they lose a lot of this other stuff, a lot of the rest of his vision, where he thought of ways that this city could unite the nation. And I think if L'Enfant had found a way to allow his ego to work alongside with the commissioners, right? He broadly refuses to work for them and thinks he should only answer to Washington. But if he were able to swallow that and work with the commissioners, then we might have been able to keep some of those features of the L'Enfant plan that had a more aspirational nature to them that were designed to bring people together. And that would have been nice to see, I think. Adam, now that you've explored Washington, D.C., where is your interest in urban history taking you next? Are you researching a new city? Well, no. Right now, my focus is still on Washington, D.C. I'm actually working on turning my work on early D.C. into a game for classroom use. For a few years now, I've been working with a pedagogy in my ancient history class, which is a sort of hobby class of mine. And that pedagogy is called reacting to the past. And in reacting games, the students in the class are assigned a historical character from a pivotal time and place in history. And each character, the students get a biography and the character has a set of ideals that they need to stay true to those ideals, but how they move forward in the game and what they do in that character is up to the student. Often they're grouped together in factions of people with similar goals and ideals. And as a class, they have to work together to work their way through the major issues facing the society at the time. Earlier this summer, I workshopped my plans for an early DC version of this type of game at a reacting conference. And it went really well. I'm really excited to move forward with that project. I think this discussion of what the national capital should be and what these places mean for America and what they mean to these politicians would work really well in the classroom. And I'm excited about moving forward with that. Wow. That's a really different project. And it sounds really cool, too. Good luck with it. Thanks. So how can we get in contact with you if we have any questions about your new game or about the early history of Washington, D.C.? Well, I'm available in all sorts of ways. 
I seem to tweet less and less these days as Twitter gets sadder and sadder. But I'm on Twitter at Adam underscore Costanzo. I've got my personal website at adamcostanzo.com. The book has a website at georgewashingtonswashington.com. And if you want to connect with me most directly, you can check out my contact info and the other info about me at the Texas A&M University Corpus Christi website for the history department. Adam Costanzo, it was really nice to talk with you again. Thank you so much for coming on and for taking us through the early history of Washington, D.C. Thanks, Liz. I had a great time. The capital of the United States is a federal district located on the banks of the Potomac River between Maryland and Virginia. The fact that the capital was a federal district represents the early Congress's desire to set the nation's capital apart from any state, because experience had told it that placing the nation's seat of government within states or municipalities could often prove difficult. For example, in 1783, a group of disgruntled soldiers marched on the nation's capital at Philadelphia for their pay. Only, rather than marching straight to the National Congress, they took their complaints to the Pennsylvania Assembly. It was a show of force and protest that demonstrated the soldiers' purposeful lack of respect for the nation's new government, because they sought the resources of what was thought to be a more powerful state government to rectify their grievances. This act, plus other confrontations and conflict with state and local governments, prompted the framers of the Constitution of 1787 to realize that the nation needed its own district a place and space for its government apart from all other states. So they wrote a clause in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, granting Congress the power to establish a special national district of its own as the permanent seat of the nation's government. Now, if Thomas Jefferson is to be trusted, he helped broker the deal that led Congress to build its new federal district on the banks of the Potomac River. Even if he's not to be trusted, we know that Congress chose the Potomac River and empowered President George Washington to determine the exact location of the new city. Washington opted to place the capital as close as he could to his hometown of Alexandria, Virginia. It was a place with lots of Chesapeake farmland, woods, and even a small settlement, a few streets wide, called Georgetown. Washington then hired Pierre L'Enfant to design the new capital. Both he and L'Enfant shared a grand vision for the city. They saw it as a place that would unite Americans from the north, south, and west as one people, and as a city that would project the power and grandeur of a mighty nation. Now, although Washington and L'Enfant had planned to construct a really grand capital, it fell upon Congress to fund and actually build the new capital city. And given that the United States was not yet a mighty nation with a large tax base, it opted to rely on revenue generated from land speculation schemes and donations from Maryland and Virginia. It also relied on enslaved labor to do the actual building of the capital. This meant that by 1800, when the Residence Act mandated that the capital would move from Philadelphia to the new Federal District of Columbia, the new capital city consisted of just over 100 brick homes and about 3,200 people strewn across a city that measured 81 square miles. Needless to say, Congress didn't initially fulfill the grand vision Washington and L'Enfant had for the capital city. It didn't even really become serious about establishing such a capital city until after the War of 1812. After that war, which saw British Marines burn most of the government's infrastructure, Congress authorized the rebuilding of the White House and the Capitol building. It reaffirmed its commitment to the banks of the Potomac River. And later, during the Jacksonian era, it would prove that commitment when it authorized the construction of the grand Romanesque stone and marble buildings that Washington and L'Enfant had once envisioned. Now, as Adam noted, the spaces and places we construct have meaning. George Washington and Pierre L'Enfant envisioned a grand imperial capital, but this was not a vision that could be realized by 1800. The United States government simply didn't have the resources to realize it. But over time, the United States expanded. It began to really stretch from the Atlantic to the Pacific, which caused it to physically look like a place that needed a grand capital city. So from the Jacksonian era forward, Congress and the American people began to invest in Washington's vision. And Washington, D.C., really started to take on the appearance of the grand capital city that Washington had imagined. For more information about Adam, his book, George Washington's Washington, plus notes for everything we talked about today, check out the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com 222. Audible is offering you a 30-day free trial. Every month, Audible members can choose three titles, one audiobook and two Audible originals which you can listen to on any device, anytime, anywhere. To take advantage of your 30-day free trial, visit audible.com slash bfworld or text 
BF World to 500-500. Audible. The most inspiring minds, the most compelling stories. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So please be a good friend and tell all the people in your life about your favorite shows. Like Ben Franklin's World. Finally, I have a time warp question for you. If Congress knew in 1790 that the United States would encompass 50 states and span from the Atlantic to the Pacific, where do you think it would have placed the national capital? Do you still think it would be settled on the banks of the Potomac River? Let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.